I'm starting to wear my hair curly again. I don't know if we like it, but... Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Finally, I am getting through the pipeline a little bit and I have more updates for you. Like I said in part one, I'm only going to be making these videos as I go through the pipeline. There's no point in me trying to give you information of stuff that I haven't gone through. So bear with me. This video still does not include anything about classes yet. I know. Probably within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be able to vlog a few minutes of each day when I'm going through classes, um, just like what classes I went to that day, what my schedule was like, stuff like that, because I guess that's what you want to see. So in my last video, I kind of left off on the check-in process. So for me, I went through a COVID check-in process. So depending on when you watch this video, it could be the same for you, it could be different, but I'm just gonna kind of walk you through what happened to me. And because I was going through this during COVID, I had traveled here from Oklahoma and on my no earlier than check-in date, I had to call into the base and basically do like an over the phone check-in. Um, they just asked for like some basic information. They sent me some paperwork via email that I had to print out, fill out, and then scan back to them. So it was really easy. It will take you less than an hour. And then from that point, they told me, okay, you are now on your two week ROM. You can go to the grocery store to get food, but other than that, stay in your house. And it was actually really nice to have that little grace period because since we had just gotten here, it gave us a lot of time to move in, unpack our stuff and get settled without like, the craziness of having to start work already. So now that you've checked in, even though it didn't feel like a real check-in, it was just the phone check-in, now you are officially part of the school's command. So the waiting period from when you check in to when you begin classes is called phase one. When you go through the class period, that's phase two. And then when you begin flying, that's phase three. This video is just going to focus on phase one. And then once I did the phone check-in, they couldn't just not keep accountability of me for two weeks. So what happens is everyone in the school's command, they get emailed a Google form every morning and they have to fill out that Google form. And that's basically their way of taking accountability during this COVID era. Um, a few times a week, you'll get that email and it will say that there is a random physical muster and if you're on ROM, then obviously you shouldn't be on the physical muster because you're supposed to be at home, restriction of movement. But once you are off of your two week ROM period, it is possible that you could be on that physical muster and you'll have to go into base, check in by like, I think it's nine o'clock they give you. So you see that email at 7 a.m. and then you put your khakis on, you just go on to base, sign a little document saying, that you were there and then you leave. And this is much different from the way that they used to muster. So it's partially because of COVID, also because of the attack they had at NAS Pensacola last December. So prior to all of this kind of happening at once, um, all the students used to go in between 07 and 07.30 every morning and they would do a face-to-face -face check in that way. Um, so like I said, it may go back to that at some point, depending on when you're watching this video, I'm just going to be giving you what I went through. So during my two week ROM, I also had a virtual check-in brief. So this was just like a Microsoft Teams meeting that they had sent out and everyone had their cameras off and we just listened to the division officer. They just gave like a quick little brief on um, you know, like what's expected of you, important phone numbers, the, the typical like Navy intro brief. But other than that check-in brief and the daily musters, that was the only connection I had to base for two weeks, which was really weird because you're like getting ready for this big transition in your life, moving from one place to another to like start your naval career. And <laughs> it just felt very like anticlimactic. <laughs> 
So after my two weeks of ROM was up, I was contacted via email saying that it was time for me to go do my in-person check-in. So I was definitely super nervous <laughs> in this because it was like my first actual interaction with the base other than calling them on the phone. But it was super easy. Um, I think it took like less than an hour. You know the deal, you show up in either your blues or your whites and bring all important documents that you have for the military. Um, so especially your orders, fit reps, um, and medical documents. Bring all that stuff with you. It's better to have more than less and have to go back home and then come back to base. But I got there, um, got all of my paperwork squared away so that they could start my student file and then they basically said okay you're good to go you can go back home <laughs> so i said that they used to do in-person musters but they switched to this um online google form muster the reason this is kind of weird is because you won't have to go on to base every day unless you get an email saying that you have something scheduled on base or that you need to come on base for a specific reason. Other than that, you are just staying at home, waking up at 07 and filling out the Google form. And a lot of people go back to bed right after that. Super weird because that's not what you would think of going into the military. So after you do your physical check-in, they're basically just gonna tell you, okay, you can go home and you will be notified when we need you to come back to base. So basically what happens is you go home, you continue to do that Google um, muster form every morning at 07, and if the base needs you for an appointment, if they've scheduled an appointment for you or whatever, they will let you know via email, but other than that, there's no requirements of you. Now, yes, this is nice for some people. For me, I just like to be in the know. I like to know what's going on behind the scenes. So it was kind of weird for me just to like not know exactly what was happening, but being told that stuff was happening, if that makes sense. And now the expected waiting time for you to start classes from the time you check in to the first day of your class, it's like four-ish months. It could be a little less, it could be a little more. Basically, it just depends on how many students are in the waiting pool at the time that you check in, You know how many students are ahead of you, and it also depends on how many students they're allowing into class. So right now, because of COVID, I know they were doing classes online so the only thing you would go on to base for was to take an exam but since then they've brought back in-person classes and the class sizes are much smaller than they previously were so that's also kind of slowed down the process of getting people through the pipeline but before you become eligible to begin class there's a few things that you have to do so one you have to do your anthros again so you've probably already done your anthro measurements um, prior to getting to NAS Pensacola, but they're going to redo them here. And that's the first thing that you get done. And then once you get your anthros done, you can go to NAMI. So NAMI is basically just redoing your flight physical. After you get the sign off from the doc with your upchit saying that you're good to go, medically cleared, then you can take your APIT. The APIT is basically a PRT that doesn't count towards anything. It's just to make sure that you are physically qualified for aviation. So I believe they give you two chances to take it and pass the APIT. Just pass it the first time. And if you've looked at any other like blogs or threads about flight school, it probably tells you that you are running the APIT on a chip trail and it says, go check out the chip trail before you run so that you know what to expect. We didn't run it on the chip trail. I don't know if that's like permanent change. Um, we just ran it on the track that they had. So I don't know if they're keeping that or what, but that's what we did. Um, we also only conducted the push-ups and the run. That's because right now the Navy is transitioning out of doing sit-ups and into the plank because of COVID. 
it's just not official yet. So they just took that out completely. And then once you're done with the APIT and you've passed, then you can go on to intermediate water survival. So that will last like a week and a couple of days. I'm not gonna go super in depth into water survival in this video. Um, I'm gonna make another video for that so you can check it out. I'll link it maybe somewhere here. But I think that you guys would get um, more benefits out of me doing a detailed like day by day video of what to expect during intermediate water survival. Once you complete water survival, your name gets put on this list that says, okay, this person has done all these requirements. They are ready to go into class. So hopefully within the next few weeks after water survival, you will get another email saying, congratulations, you are going to be classing up and this is your class date. So I feel like I went through all that pretty fast. Just know that this is not a fast process. Like I said, it can take three, four, five months for you from the time that you check in until the time that you start class. So just to do a quick recap, I just talked about four events that you have to complete just to start classes. So one, anthros, and this has to be done first because anthros have to be done before NAMI. So this is your flight physical. NAMI has to be done before your APIT, so the PRT and then the PRT has to be done before you start water survival. And then there are also two other events that you will have to do, but it doesn't matter what order you get these done in, um, they just kind of fill the spots as they need. So one is your flight suit fitting. This is super quick, takes like 30 minutes. You know, they rope and choke you with measurements, you try on some stuff and you get a little note card with all of your measurements and all of your sizes and do not lose that because when you go to gear issue for starting class, they need this note card. That note card is the only thing that will get you your flight suit. Otherwise, if you've lost that note card, you're just gonna have to go do your flight fit again and it's just, it wastes your time. It wastes the people's time who's doing the flight fit and then you will get scheduled for a history and ethics class. So again, because of COVID, this is happening online right now. I don't know if they're gonna eventually change out of that and do it in person. Basically, they're each like an hour long, both in the same day. I think you get maybe like a 30 minute break or like an hour break in between the two. And you just open it up on the computer and listen. There's no like quiz afterwards, you just, to show up and listen. Now I've mentioned a lot of appointments and events that you will get scheduled for. And if you're wondering like Spana, am I gonna have to schedule this myself? Like how does this happen? So flight management, which is the office that is basically in charge of all the students in schools command, they schedule all of your appointments for you. So that makes it really easy because all you have to wait on is getting an email saying, hey, you're scheduled for this, show up at this time, at this place, in this uniform. If you know some people who arrived around the same time you are and they're getting scheduled for stuff, but you're not, then it doesn't hurt to give them a quick call just to make sure that you didn't like slip through the cracks. There's a lot of people they have to keep track of and there's a lot of different ways that they do that, a lot of different people that do that. So unfortunately that happens, um, but it's just kind of knowing when you should reach out to them versus they just haven't gotten to you yet. Hopefully by the time you get here, whoever is watching this video, then the restrictions will be a little bit more lenient because of COVID. Right now we still can't go to non-essential businesses, so we can't go to like restaurants and bars, which just kind of sucks because you're just waiting here, not doing anything. <laughs> and you have to kind of sit at home and find a hobby. Um, you don't really get to explore Pensacola. So like I said, hopefully that changes for you guys watching this. Definitely just try to make the most out of that waiting period that you have because once you start school, you're just gonna have to kick it into gear and you're gonna wish that you had that waiting time back. So 
find a hobby, um, find some outdoors things you can do. I mean, you could still like go to the beach to just like walk around, get some fresh air, um, explore some other towns and just like walk around outside. And if you're really motivated, then you can actually start kind of doing some like pre-studying for class. They give you a lot of study material when you check in. Um, just like some PowerPoints and PDFs and stuff. So it might behoove you to check those out while you're waiting. I mean, there's gonna be some days where you're probably just gonna be sitting in bed, sitting on the couch. So you might as well have that stuff up on your laptop. If you're finding it hard to like get the motivation to do that, maybe just make like a couple days of the week dedicated to, okay, these days I'm going to study for an hour or two hours and just like break it up like that. Basically what I'm saying is you just have a lot of time to do nothing. So figure out how to use that time wisely. Okay, so there's just a couple things left that I wanna talk about uh, for this phase one period. So one are watches. So there is a group of Ensign watch coordinators who put together all of the rosters for watch every day. So if they have a lot of people to pull from, then you can get lucky and you may only have watch like once every couple of weeks, maybe even just once a week. If there's not a lot of people to pull from, then unfortunately you could be standing watch multiple times a week. It just depends. It just depends on how many students are rolling through the program at that time. And the watches are really easy. You show up in your khakis. Some of them are eight hours. Some of them are like four. It just depends on which area you get stationed for watch. So most of the watches are either like a barracks watch or a like front entrance watch. So for the front entrance watches, basically you're just going to be checking um, IDs and also temp checks right now because of COVID. And then for each watch station, there's going to be a specific set of instructions telling you what's expected. So for instance, I had to stand watch at a barracks building. So it basically told me, hey, once an hour, you have to just roam around, make sure that like nothing crazy is going on and that's it. But if you do have any questions, then just get in contact with the watch bill coordinator. They will hopefully be able to help you out. And then another thing that I wanted to talk about are stash jobs. So this is something that I had kind of seen like here and there on threads when I was doing a little bit of research before coming to NAS Pensacola. And there wasn't a whole lot of information on them. So I hope that maybe this gives you like a better idea. So one, what is a stash job? You can kind of think of a stash job as like a collateral duty. It's not something that's required required of you for going through flight school. Um, it's just kind of something extra that you can do while you're waiting. Two, how do you get a SAS job? Sometimes you will get an email saying you've been voluntold, we all love that word, voluntold for a SAS job. Or when you go to do your check-in, you can let someone know in-flight management and they'll put you down saying, hey, this person is interested in a SAS job and then someone should get back to you rather quickly. If you forget to do that while you check in, you can always just call the flight management office and just let them know. Three, what does a stash job entail? Well, it kind of depends on the stash job. So most of the stash jobs that are available are flight management stash jobs. And like I said, this is the office that's like in charge of all of the student admin that goes on in school's command. So if you do end up working in the flight management office, then you're basically just gonna be doing like a lot of computer work, you know, Excel, um, paperwork, filing. But then there's also other SAS jobs like the museum SAS jobs where you work at the museum for a few hours. And then if you're working in flight management, depending on your job, you could come in every day, but only work from like seven to 10 or seven to 11 or you could only come in like once or twice a week and then work from seven to close of business, which is usually around like two or three. So personally, I've been working in the flight management office and my job, basically I go in usually about two times a week 
and I go in from seven to close a business. So that's usually, like I said, two or three o'clock. And I just sit on a computer. I send out a lot of emails. I work on Excel and I file stuff away. Now there are also other SAS jobs like museum SAS jobs where you will just have like a few hour shift working at the museum. Um, we have people who help with the APIT every week. So then you just show up once a week for like an hour, hour and a half, and just help take care of those scores. I really can't think of all the staff jobs off the top of my head right now. They're always changing. So like I said, just let flight management know that you're interested in a staff job and they can let you know what's available or get you in contact with some of the people who have those staff jobs if you want to learn more. Okay, so finally, I've told you all this about staff jobs and you're like, Savannah, why would I want a staff job when I can just wake up, do my Google form, and then go back to sleep? Here's the thing. If you have a staff job, one, you don't have to do the muster every day. Obviously right now, since we're still doing the Google form online muster, it's not that big of a deal. But if they ever transition back to doing the in-person muster, then it's really nice to not have to drive to base every morning at 07 just to muster for a few minutes. Second, you don't get put on the watch bill if you have a staff job. Like I said, the watch bill will really depend on how many students they have to pull from, but it's really nice when people are having to stand watch two, three times a week, each eight hours long. So they're spending 24 hours on base, but you have a staff job, so you're only going on to base twice a week for five hour shifts each. So 10 hours versus 24 hours for watch. And then lastly, if you have a staff job, you just get to interact with a lot more people. You get to interact with some of the other ensigns that have staff jobs. You get to interact with the division officers that are going to be in charge of you. Um, you get to interact with some of the civilian workers who take care of like a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. So if all of those people see you, you know, every week you're coming in, busting your ass, um, doing a good job, hopefully, <laughs> then, you know, they will have a much higher opinion of you than the students that they haven't seen for the last couple of months because they're just doing an online muster. For me, this was actually the number one reason that I wanted a stash job. I just like, knowing the people that I'm working with. I like them to know who I am rather than just like sitting back and being in the shadows. I don't, I just don't like that. It's also something that can be added to your fit rep if you do a good job. So I've enjoyed my SAS position. Um, yes, obviously I've put in more work than I would have if I was just sitting at home, but I didn't really mind anyways because there's only so much that I can do at home while waiting for months. So guys, that is all about phase one. Any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have are appreciated. And if you want to get notified when I make new videos, like when I start talking about class, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button and also click on the bell so that you get notified whenever I post new videos. As always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.